Albert Einstein has once said that pure mathematics is, in its way, the poetry of logical ideas. And I suppose we could relate to this if we understand and are able to apply these logical ideas. And in most instances, mathematics would be very interesting, but it would be very different from learning maths as a subject and not really understanding, but blindly applying mechanics compared to actually understanding the logics behind it. And from this, we can actually gauge and learn more interesting stuff about mathematics and the real parts of mathematics. Therefore, today, please allow me to discuss with you some of my own discoveries about mathematical sequence linked to the Fibonacci numbers. Thank you. We would have all at one point come across sequences somewhere in our lives, no matter if it was in a real life application or even something as simple as a math competition. I am sure that at least most of the students here or even all of the students here would recognize the sequence. This is known as the Fibonacci sequence. But first, let's take a look at how the Fibonacci sequence even works. It first starts off, it first starts off with two pairs of ones then it follows by a 2, a 3, a 5, and an 8. The pattern here is that 2 would equal to 1 plus 1, and 3 would equal to 2 plus 1. To sum this up into basic words, to calculate the next term in the sequence is the sum of the two previous consecutive terms. And I'm sure if lots of the students here go back to KS3 math, we might remember the sequences and formulae topic that our teachers used to rant to us about. So the formula for the Fibonacci sequence is as follows. F of base n equals F base n minus one plus F of base n minus two. Take n as the 10th term, for example. n minus one would be the ninth term plus the eighth term, which is exactly what the Fibonacci sequence states. Let's move on to the next slide. A quick historical overview. This is Leonardo of Pisa or Leonardo Bonacci or also known as Fibonacci. And the Fibonacci sequence and modern arithmetic that we use today has actually been used for many, many centuries from ancient Sanskrit texts using arithmetic and regular numerals that we use today. But this man, Fibonacci, pieced all of this information together and wrote it in his book, Liber Abaci, which was originally actually used as a cookbook for merchants to calculate their day-to-day -day expenses. But the thing which is special about this book is that this was the first ever time sequences was introduced within the world of math. Now, within his book as well, he proposed a problem, which was the first ever problem to involve sequences formally. This is known as the Fibonacci rabbits. How it works is you have two pairs, you have one pair of rabbits, one male and one female. Let's make some base assumptions first about these rabbits. Assume that they take one month to mature until they are able to mate and whenever they mate, they can produce another pair of rabbits within one month. The other pair also being always a male and a female. Once we dive down into this rabbit hole, we actually notice that the amount of pairs that they produce are always going to be Fibonacci's numbers with these assumptions. And the problem that he stated in his book was with one pair at the beginning of the year, after one year, how many pairs of rabbits would there actually be? The answer to that, if we d dive down into this rabbit hole of Fibonacci numbers, would be 144. But the really interesting thing here is that if we go on to an extra 12 months and it reaches two years, the number would increase to over 46,000 pairs of rabbits. Let's move on to an, another interesting play of numbers here. This is the Pascal's triangle. It starts with a one at the top and two ones following by it, and then a one, two, and one. How it works is that it's a geometrical representation of tri triangular numbers, and the next number in a sequence, take 21 for example, would be the sum of six and 15, or the sum of the two numbers right above it. You could think of this as an addition pyramid, but going down instead of going up. The Pascal's triangle is actually also used to calculate the coefficient of binomial expression expansions, as well as used in common matrix and modern algebra today.
But what we notice about Pascal's triangle is also really interesting, especially its linkage to indices and powers as well. Right here, the 1, 2, 4, and 8, and so on, would be somewhat noticeable to us, or almost completely noticeable to us, as these are actually the powers of 2. 2 to the power of 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 squared is 2, and etc. But I'll give you a moment. Do you notice any other link to powers within the Pascal's triangle here? Well, yes, there is. And it's the power of 11s. For example, we have 11 to the 0 at the top, which is 1. But instead of summing up, the numbers are completely represented by itself. 11 to the 1 would be 11. 11 squared would be 121. 11 cubed would be 1,331, and so on. But we might get a little bit tricked here. But this is something which we also learn in CS, which is shifts. The 11 to the power of 5 is actually 165051. But once we shift it, we will get the exact same number, which follows with the other numbers as you go further along into the Pascal's triangle. Now, let's go back to its linkage of the Fibonacci sequence here. When you sum up the diagonals of the Pascal's triangle, you start to actually see the Fibonacci sequence embedded right in it. And you might be asking, well, what's the linkage between Pascal's triangle and the Fibonacci sequence? Well, it would be that Pascal's triangle is actually derived straight from Fibonacci sequences, but it's just read and represented in a different way. Take the 2 here, for example, it's the sum of the two numbers right above it, which is exactly what Fibonacci's law in, in his sequence states, that the next term is the sum of the two previous terms. So let's dive into some real-life applications of these two sequences that I've mentioned right here. This is a pineapple, and yes, the Fibonacci sequences are embedded right into the pineapple. For example, Let's say you were to take a pineapple when you get home and count the number of squares in one complete spiral. I guarantee you that that number would always be a Fibonacci number. And these numbers, 8, 13, and 21, are actually Fibonacci numbers. And let's move on to another application within nature. These are sunflowers. They're the third most well-known flower in the world. And the Fibonacci sequence is actually embedded right in it, including its seed head. When sunflowers sprout, they often come up with the seed heads first. And this seed head is constructed based off spirals, known as the Fibonacci spiral within sunflowers or Fibonacci phyllotaxis, which is the study of the roots, stem, and head of a flower. What we notice here is that the number of spirals we get is always, or most of the time, a sum of two Fibonacci numbers. For example, 34 in this very unique sunflower. Now, suppose you are a fan of squaring numbers. Let's say we were to square the Fibonacci numbers themselves. We would get 1, 1, 4, 9, and 25, and etc. Now, let's say we were to add these numbers. When we add the first three, we get 6. Add the second four, add the four, we get 15. 5, 40, and 6, 104. But what we notice here is absolutely beautiful. The Fibonacci numbers are embedded right into the answers and the sums of these squared Fibonacci numbers. Take 6. 6 would be 2 times 3, both Fibonacci numbers. Take 15, 15 would be 3 times 5, also both Fibonacci numbers. 40 of 5 times 8, and 104 of 8 times 13. If you listen to those numbers that I mentioned, I mentioned numbers 2, 3, 5, 8, and 13. Now, with 2, 3, 5, 8, and 13, we see the Fibonacci sequence. But let's say we were to represent this in a more geometrical manner. And based off those assumptions that we made just now, we could actually say that 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 8 squared is equal to 8 times 13. And let's represent this geometrically and actually solve this. 
Suppose you might have seen this in a math competition somewhere or somehow. Most people to calculate the area of this rectangle would probably sum 5 and 8 of 13, multiply it by 8, and that would give us 104, which is equivalent to 8 times 13. But the reason why it's so quick to calculate this with Fibonacci sequence instead of, for example, counting out the squares is because it's actually the same thing. Let's say we assume that one side length of the square is equiv equivalent to the number within the square. In this case, 1 squared plus 1 squared would be 2. 2 squared plus 4 would be 6. 6 plus 9 would be 15. 40 once it's added to 25. And once it's added to 64, we get 104, which would be the exact same thing as 13 times 8. But now, squares is all about multiplying and especially calculating the area of squares. But what if we were to do the opposite of that instead? 8 times 13 here would be 104. But suppose we did 13 divided by 8 instead. We get the number 1.625. And let's continue down this rabbit hole. Instead of 13 times 29, let's do 21 divided by 13. We get 1.615. 21 times 34. 34 divided by 21 with 1.619, etc. And the more we deep the more we deep dive into this rabbit hole of numbers, we get a number and we start narrowing down into a number which is approximately 1.618. This number of 1.618 is so special because this is what surrounds us everywhere. This number is known as the golden ratio. Now, since we've been looking at spirals in sunflowers, for example, and the pineapple spirals, we're starting to notice a pattern with spirals. So let's say we were to represent this square right here in spiral form instead. This would be the exact form of the golden ratio, and this would be the infamous quadratic formula, which I'm sure most of you have seen. So let's do a quick derivation on the board of what the quadratic formula was to derive the golden ratio. From the denominator, we see that 2a and 2 are completely identical. And from this, we can get that a equals 1. And I'll write my answer at the, at the top here as well, so we can use it later in the equation. We also see that negative b is equal to 1 from the beginning of the numerator, meaning that b would be equal to negative 1. And now, all we need to do is actually just plug this in. Since b squared minus 4ac and 5 are both in the root of the numerator, we could say b squared minus 4ac is actually equivalent to 5 itself. And if we were to plug b and a in, we would get 1 minus 4c is equivalent to 5, meaning that c would be equivalent to negative 1. Now, quadratic formulas are often expressed in the expression of ax squared plus bx plus c equals to 0. Once we write this in, we get the quadratic equation of x squared minus x minus 1 as the quadratic equation which was first used by the mathematician Euler to derive the golden ratio. Now let's go on to some real life examples about the golden ratio and its day-to-day -day usages. I'll provide a quick psychological perspective to this as well. Our human brain perceives the beauty and attractiveness of things based off a database. And in our case, our database is the things that we see around us every day. Coincidentally, nature actually follows go the golden ratio very often. And this would link to the example of on the beach. Let's say I had two hands, one, a seashell, with a perfect spiral, even though it might not be very big, but it would be similar to this. And another seashell which would look a little bit old and crooked, and the spiral was not very perfect. When humans talk about perfect spirals, the actual term to correct them would be the golden ratio here is almost close to perfect, but we never can get a perfect golden ratio. And I guarantee you that the kid would always pick the one with the perfect spiral instead of the one with the not perfect spiral. 
Let's go on to another example of the infamous painting, Van Gogh's Starry Night. The element that they used in the artwork here is actually called fractals. And the definition of a fractal is an endless piece where no matter how much you zoom into it, it will most of the time look the same. And scientists have actually proven that once you look long enough into the starry night painting, you'll start to see that the spirals begin to move a little bit. This is because of the element of fractals and its aesthetically pleasing uh, elements to the brain. Fractals also use and are straightly derived from the golden ratio, which is what's so aesthetically pleasing about it. One last example, would be the infamous painting of the waves at Matsushima. We can see, obviously, that the golden ratio is perfectly followed here. And we can even see the squares where they originate from. And these squares are perfectly identical to the squares where you see in those daunting math competitions. These squares are known as the Fibonacci squares. And this exactly links to how we would represent the Fibonacci squares in a spiral. And artists often do this in most paintings nowadays to give that aesthetically pleasing property to you. In conclusion, life does find a way. No matter if it were to be with spirals, life does find a way. In this case, it would be finding the way of a random sequence which would never even ever be expected to be followed in real life situations or to be applied in nature. Going back to the sunflower example, the reason why they use the Fibonacci spiral is because the Fibonacci sequence is often associated with perfect packing of seeds, meaning they would minimize the overlap of seeds, but they would also maximize the amount of sunlight each seed gets, which is why often even other flowers with the number of petals would follow the Fibonacci sequence to maintain adequate sunlight. Next time you visit Greece as well, just take a look at the Pantheon to see how it would relate to the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. Thank you very much.